Um, we, we move on to the next presentation by Dr. Mohammed um, Erugindi. Um, he is a cyber security expert and uh, who is also a media personality. And um, so uh, Dr. Mohammed um, Erugindi, uh, uh, would, would you start your presentation, please? Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Satoshi, and thanks for everyone. And uh, it's, it's a good opportunity to, uh, to be with you. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Sayed, you know, started the keynote speech with uh, connecting the dots. And I think uh, we we are, we are living in an interdisciplinary world right now. So uh, let me share my presentation, and we we can discuss later what what I mean by the the interdisciplinary uh, uh, world. So please let me know if you see my screen. Yes, uh, we can see it. Okay, let me go with the full uh, screen. Um, this is the PowerPoint. I sent you the PDF because of the videos in the in the presentation. And uh, the title of the presentation is, uh, um, you know, the cybercrime in the Middle East, the social, political, and economic issues. Um, why I, I tried to, to speak about uh, the entire Middle East, not only in Egypt. Egypt will, will be part of the presentation at the end of the presentation, but uh, why I choose the uh, Middle East? Because, um, you know, the the issue of the cybersecurity, I think it is connected in the Middle East. It is the same issues which is, uh, you know, arising in different countries in the Middle East. Um, we can see some kind of similarities between countries in, in, in the Middle East. So what we are going to face in the, the near future and what we are facing now in the cybersecurity is very, you know, similar in, in different countries in, in, in the Middle East. So I will not speak about myself again, but I just want to ask uh, all the audience uh, this question is, um, are we living in, in the Matrix? I think you, you watch the, the, the movie Matrix. Um, in 1999, I think, you know, 91, I don't remember the date, but this is the, it's an old movie. Um, most people are now thinking of the concept of the Matrix uh, movie. So let's re remember, uh, you know, a, a little part of the Matrix movie and to see if we are really living in the Matrix right now. dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? What is the Matrix? It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. Let's stop the hype at this level, but I just want to uh, remember the movie uh, Matrix because um, most people uh, didn't understand that uh, this day that uh, this movie, you know, had a very, very important concept, which is uh, the cyberspace, which is we, we are living here now. And also, we, if we are talking about uh, the science fiction movies, I will not forget Japan for, for, for sure, because, you know, Japan is a big culture when it comes to, to cyberpunk movies, uh, something like uh, Ghost on the Chill and all those good movies that we have, you know, influenced by in the science fiction uh, domain. Um, the, the Most people um, don't know maybe that uh, the Matrix movie is based on a, uh, a novel by William Gibson uh, in 1982, uh, it's called The New Romancer. This, this, this is the very, very important also in the novel which is the first in the first time that someone uh, you know mentioned the cyberspace and uh, if if we um, try to understand what william gibson uh, tried to explain what the cyberspace is which is the matrix uh, he, he he described it as a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions of legitimate operators in every nation by children being told mathematical concepts to graphic representation of data 
abstracted from banks of every computer in the human system. So if you think of this concept, I think we we are living in the matrix. Even if you if you watch it, the, the the trailer again, he was asked about uh, uh, the matrix is in in matrix you don't understand and you don't differentiate what's true and what's false. And maybe this is also reflected on what we are facing now in cyberspace, especially in the media, as uh, my friend uh, Mr. Ahmed just uh, mentioned about the fake news and all those things. So it's 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 connected. Everything is connected now. So and uh, when it comes to connectivity, I will not forget to mention the fourth industrial revolution, and uh, um, it's the beginning of a revolution that's changing everything now. We are now uh, thinking of the connectivity of everything, the new economy that's based on the, you know, the, the, the new industries that's shaping the, the, the new um, uh, world of connecting everything to everything. Um, you know, talking machines to each other, um, data that's, um, you know, going through from machine to machine and, uh, you know, things that are connecting the, the physical world to the logical world. And that comes also to the new uh, idea of the digital world, which is, in my opinion, is um, there is a, a blurring between the lines of the digital and physical world. So we don't now able, you know, differentiate between the, the physical and the, you know, the, the, the logical world. If you are living in, with your mind in a cyberspace, you don't even, um, you know, understand how things are going on the, in the physical world because it, it's connecting and the cyberspace is affecting the, the you know the physical world and that's how the digital world is 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 going to affect our lives in the future and this is will have you know major consequences so when it comes to to middle east from my point of view that uh, there is some characteristics of the you know the cyberspace in the middle east different from other uh, areas in the world uh, one of the, the major things is uh, internet penetration in the Middle East. Internet penetration in the Middle East is, uh, if, if, uh, you know, according to the statistics, is uh, it's outpacing the rest of the world. When when we are comparing the statistics of 2008, for example, this is uh, was mentioned in my research. That's why I, I mentioned 2008. And uh, when we are comparing it with 2019 statistics, we will find that. Uh, a huge difference in you know growth of user uh, on the internet in the Middle East and also the penetration of the the internet among the you know the uh, users in the in the countries. So internet penetration is is you know according to the statistics about seventy percent of the population and this is very uh, you know very large numbers. So the situation in the Middle East when it comes to cyber crime, for example. Um, I, I published an article in 2008 in ISSA uh, journal, which is the largest uh, information system security association in the world. Um, it was in 2008, I was trying to predict what will happen in the Middle East when it comes to cyber crime. Um, I found in, in, in my research that there is, um, you know, uh, special characteristics of the cyber crime uh, in, in the Middle East because of the key reasons that will increase the problem in the future. That was in 2008. By so now we are in you know 2021 and i think the the issues is, is not different so we are talking about the state of ict infrastructure in the middle east most people in the middle east thinking of business first safety later and this is this is a big issue and we are still facing these things now uh, the growth of user base so we are witnessing growth of user base in everywhere in the middle east especially uh, when we are talking about digitalization digital transformation and all those things uh, smart cities, uh, any, everywhere in the Middle East, people are connecting to the internet. So we have also poor security awareness programs. So we, we don't have proper security awareness programs in the Middle East, uh, unfortunately. Uh, when it comes to regulation, and I will talk later about the regulation, even you, you, you find a poor regulation or, or no regulation at all. So this is also a big issue in, when it comes to cybercrime in the Middle East. Uh, also, lack of training for, for you know, uh, law enforcement, the judiciary system, civil societies, and all people who are, you know, dealing with it, with such a threat in, in the 21st centuries. Uh, also, we are dependent on the off-the-shelf system solutions, and this is this is a big issue because you have a black box. You don't understand how these things are operating and uh, what's the vulnerabilities inside these systems. So, especially systems that are, you know, connected to the critical infrastructure. 
Uh, also, we have financial problems in most countries in the Middle East and also the political problems when we go back to the so-called Arab Spring, as, as my friend just mentioned uh, right now. And uh, the last thing is the terrorism, which is, I think all of you understand how terrorism is, is, is working in the, in the Middle East. These all things that are creating the, the characteristic of the, of the cybercrime in the Middle East. All people, you know, all criminals in the Middle East are, are, are online right now. When we are talking about conventional crimes, talking about cybercrime, the true cybercrime, when we are talking about terrorism, organized crime, all those are connected now uh, in, in, in the Middle East. When it comes to economic uh, issues, we economic cost of the cybercrime, according to the World Economic Forum, it was about uh, 445 uh, billion dollars uh, of, uh, you know, um, loss to, to the economy because of the cybercrime. It's, uh, you know, it was projected to reach two, tri two trillion uh, dollars by, by 2019. And now in 2021, we are talking about six trillion dollar in cost for cybercrime. So this is, this is big numbers. That's because we are all now, you know, the world is moving to the digital transformation, to connecting everything. And this is will increase the problem of the, you know, the economic problem of the cybercrime. So the problem also with the cybercrime is the, the definition. There is no internationally agreed definition of cybercrime. And this is a big issue when it comes to regulation, when it comes also to people who are talking about uh, law, laws and, and uh, regulation in, in the region, especially in the region, because we don't understand maybe the, the, the true concept of the cyberspace. We are talking about cybercrime as something you know um, like the traditional crime it's not like this because we have different meaning of, of the cyber crime we have the narrow uh, definition of cyber crime and uh, which is true um, cyber crime which is the the computer dependent crimes like hacking um, malware and ddos attacks and all those things and we have also the broader uh, meaning of cyber crime which is i think it's the the main you know, use of the term cybercrime in most uh, regulations in, in, in the Middle East and also maybe around the world because they are describing everything that's happening on cyberspace is a cybercrime, but this is not true because you know, traditional crime is different. They are using the internet. This is not dependent on the internet. It, you, know, you can commit the crime without the internet. That's why it's not cybercrime. So um, something from the Middle East uh, there is an organized crime that rings that connected and uh, targeting the Middle East. This is one of the, 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 the famous uh, you know, crime ring that stole about $45 million from two banks in the Middle East, the National Bank of Ras al-Khaimah and Bank of Muscat. And uh, those guys were you know, working in an organized crime, in a transnational crime, and targeted banks in the, in the, in the Middle East. So the Middle East is a target for organized crime because of the, you know, uh, prosperity and in economy, especially in countries like United Arab Emirates and uh, Saudi Arabia and all the you know oil countries as we call it. Uh, this uh, another example from uh, Egypt. This is an organized crime ring, but this time is originated from Middle East. This one uh, you know was uh, in Egypt, and uh, this is about nearly uh, 50 Egyptian citizens have been charged in this uh, you know organized uh, crime ring, and they stole about one. Uh, 0.5 million uh, US dollar from uh, Bank of uh, America and, uh, and the United States. And uh, uh, another example is the cyber espionage uh, operations. When we are talking about targeting the Middle East, we will mostly find cyber espionage as a big player in the, in the, the cyber domain. So this is one of the biggest operations that, uh, you know, it targeted many countries in the Middle East, which is called the, the Operation Parliament. Um, the last thing that I was talking about in, in my research in 2008, it is now a big issue in, in, in cyberspace, which is the radicalization and the, the, you know, terrorism in, in, in cyberspace. So we have um, many materials online now, uh, you know, uh, youth can be radicalized easily uh, in, on cyberspace and we have many people who are, you know, posting videos on, on YouTube and the other social medias that are trying to radicalize the youth in, in the Middle East. And this is big issue that is now happening in the Middle East. And I think with the fall of the, of the ISIL or, or Daesh, people are now moving to, to use the internet more properly to recruit and fundraise many um, terrorist organizations. 
Uh, also, we have uh, people who, who are, you know, uh, like Anwar Lawlaki, for example, he's now dead, but, but, but uh, you know, his legacy is online because there is a lot of materials and magazines and guides that's used by many people around the world, not only in the Middle East, to create bombs, for example, to inspire many people to, to, to join terrorist organizations and how to make bombs and things like this in manuals and very, very uh, glossy materials in the, in the, in the, in the cyberspace. Uh, social media is, is, is very important for terrorism. For example, now we are seeing propaganda psychological operations uh, on, on social media, cyber attacks, uh, intelligence gathering, training, fundraising, radicalization, recruitment, communication, all those things are you know, used by terrorist organization now in the, in, the, in the Middle East and cyberspace. When it comes to state-sponsored attacks that targeted Middle East, we, we see that uh, there is um, a big player in, in, the, in the Middle East, which is Iran. Iran, they have the, their own you know, uh, cyber troops and they are working very, very actively in cyberspace targeting uh, uh, you know, uh, countries and uh, critical infrastructures and uh, trying to, uh, you know, steal information from different countries in the Middle East because it's, it's connected to a political um, issues uh, uh, this time, like this attack that targeted Aramco and Ras Gas in 2012. So we are talking about uh, Iran and uh, we will not forget to talk about Stuxnet because the uh, they were hit by Stuxnet and uh, they learned a lot from Stuxnet. They reverse engineered the code and they created their own uh, you know, arsenal of cyber weapons based on the code of the Stuxnet. And this is, you know, created too much issues in the Middle East because uh, Iran targeted the Middle East infrastructure with, with, with those um, you know, uh, new tools that is based on the code of the Stuxnet that was created mainly in Iran, like Shmoon virus, Flame, Doku, and the Triton. All those viruses or malware are based on the reverse engineered code of the Stuxnet. And, and, and this is one of the, the things that Iran has benefited from the, the Stuxnet. They, you know, they use the code to target other countries in the, in the Middle East. And this is a big issue when it comes to critical infrastructure, because in, as, I, as I mentioned, um, most countries in the Middle East install the technology and forget about it. And this is a, you know, a challenge because critical infrastructure is connected to everything. And it's now connected to, in some way or another, to a network. And this network is connected to an indirect or direct connection to the internet. And this is big um, issues for, for our critical infrastructure. And um, um, the critical infrastructure is mainly connected to something called the SCADA, SCADA systems which is the supervisory control and data acquisition or the industrial control systems. All those things are controlled by computers. So if you manage to update the software or the update uh, some kind of code in, in this uh, uh, computer that's connected to the SCADA systems, you can create you know, a disaster in, in the critical infrastructure. And this is not a theory, but you, you, what, you know witness it Stuxnet and we, we are uh, about to watch this. This is an experiment uh, created by the National Security Agency in the United States in 2007 about how to use a code to uh, destroy, to, to physically destroy an gener electric generator and how to, to, you know, if we manipulated the code uh, to uh, destroy the, the, the electric uh, grid. So and I see we, we have witnessed many uh, situations in Ukraine, for example, and in different countries in, uh, in Europe and also in the United States, how hackers are, you know, manipulated the industrial control systems to, uh, to broke the, the, the physical components of electrical grids. It's destroyed. So this is a clear example. Now the problem is with when it comes to more connectivity, we are more, more vulnerable to, uh, to threats. So people now are asking, uh, you know, they are not asking why this, this thing or this device is connected to the internet. They are mostly asking why these things are not connected to the internet. And this is the problem because we are connecting and, uh, you know, don't, uh, you know, um, uh, 
do the proper things to secure these things. And I think the Internet of Things will be the Internet of insecure things in the future and will be, you know, will be hit with, with, with many cyber attacks in, in the future. And all people, you know, and these all categories can do the, 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 the problem to the critical infrastructure like the hacktivists, for example. And uh, as you may know, hacktivists are, you know, people who are, uh, you know, hacking for a political reason. It's a, a, you know, a connection between hacking and uh, activism. And also we have this, the cyber criminals and the terrorists and the nation states. So all those players are you know, attacking critical infrastru infrastructure right now. When it comes to law, um, we are speaking about the international experiment of law when it comes to cyber crime. We have the Bodebist Treaty or the Convention on Cyber Crime. Uh, and the, for the Council of Europe, uh, which is uh, drafted 2001, now many countries are, you know, joining uh, Budapest Treaty in order to get information about cyber criminals, um, you know, around the world. I think, it, you know, there is a lot of countries outside the Council of Europe are also, you know, uh, ratified the, the Budapest Treaty. When it comes to United Nations, we have the Security Council Resolution uh, 2341. Uh, where that was speaking explicitly about the, the cyber terrorism and the, you know uh, uh, targeting the critical infrastructure and countries need to pay attention to to these kind of things and uh, you know draft legislations that protect the critical infrastructure. Also, we have uh, this General Assembly in 2018. The United Nations General Assembly uh, res uh, adopted a resolution uh, about countering the use of information and communication technologies for criminal purposes. Um, you know, 85 countries voted for this resolution and 55 countries voted against it. And, uh, you know, uh, 29 countries uh, retrained. And this is, uh, you know, uh, explained the problem of the, of the cyber crime definition around the world because what you, um, it's the same as terrorism, by the way. If you, uh, you know, um, uh, consider this one is a criminal or a terrorist, some, someone else around the world maybe consider it uh, a hero or uh, a freedom fighter. And that's why the, the, this issue is not easy in, in the international level. When it comes to Egypt, uh, General Said just uh, mentioned the Egyptian constitution. We have Article uh, 31 about protecting the cyberspace. Um, this, is, this is not, from my opinion, from my technical opinion, it's not a, a proper translation to, to the article because the article was talking about uh, the you know uh, information space and uh, you know cyberspace is different so cyberspace is not the internet and the internet is not the, the the information sphere as we call it but this article is 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 in the egyptian constitution also we have the the legal framework uh, uh, related to combating it crimes or cyber crime it crime this is what the law called it and this is why i said that the, the problem of the definition is 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 everywhere in in the Middle East. Um, it, there is no you know clear definition of cyber crime, and this is big issue when it comes to uh, legal instruments. We have also in Egypt the national cyber security strategy, uh, and the you know the drafted uh, pillars for the the strategy, and um, like for example protecting the critical infrastructure. Uh, creating, um, you know, uh, capacity building programs. And I think from my, from my point of view, and I'm not here speaking about any governmental entities that I'm working in, uh, in, my, uh, over, in my point of view as an expert, I think that we need to revisit the strategy of the cybersecurity, the national cybersecurity, because it, from my opinion, is, it's not proper right now. So, my last recommendation, and I'm very sorry if I talk too much time, um, my recommendations for the, the issues in, in, in Egypt or even in the Middle East, I think we need a proper cyber laws that's really dealing with the real threats that we are facing now in cyberspace, even with things that's er it's in interconnected like fake news and all those things that we are talking about now as a threat to the national security. Um, we need also to adopt the international standards, uh, framework, and best practice for cybersecurity. This is, you know, uh, a, th a very important thing that I don't, I do not find, um, I cannot find it in the Middle East.
Um, there is no um, international framework that's adopted in cybersecurity. For example, we have NIST, we have ENISA in Europe, we have uh, you know other standards that we can use as a framework to draft something for international standard that can be adopted in the Middle East. Um, people are talking about ISO and all those things, but from my point of view, this is you know a checklist. We are, we are not talking about checklist. We need to to create a framework for for cybersecurity in the, in the in the Middle East and in the region. Also, we need the proper uh, capacity building programs that's compatible with what we're going now in the in, in the advancement in cyberspace. Also, we need to promote international cooperation, and this is a very important you know um, uh, point to to consider when we are talking about dealing with advanced countries or developed countries like Japan that can help in you know, uh, coordinating some kind of uh, cooperation when it comes to cyberspace and also the, the, the important legacy of Japan when it comes to technology because Japan is, is very important and very pivotal, important pivotal country in this um, uh, thing. And uh, Japan from my work and also in the United Nations uh, experience, I, I know that Japan is, is, is very important country in the United Nations when it comes to uh, you know, supporting uh, capacity building programs for countering ter terrorism and also cybercrime in the, in the, around the world. I, I need to, to, to stress that we, we need, uh, all of us need to think globally. We, we, we are not in, in, in isolated in, in the 21st century. We need to think globally how to cooperate together in the 21st century. And my last word is a quote from uh, the, the cybersecurity expert, Prof Schneer, uh, when, when we said, uh, if we think, if you think technology can solve your security problems, then you don't understand the problems and you don't understand the technology. And this is the truth. People are looking for technology, not everything else. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohamed Ergindi, for your very comprehensive uh, presentation uh, of the cyber space development and the Egyptian you know, development in, in this field. And, um, uh, you know, uh, just just quick, quick question from me, uh, abusing my, my prerogative as a uh, moder moderator, you know, um, the so-called Arab Spring in 2011 was, you know, always associated with the quick expansion of you know new digital media particularly among youth at that time and in a way the the um, um penetration of of of, of you know it uh, information technology to the uh, younger generation outpaced the 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 policy yeah. From the government, yeah. so uh, it, it was a very, very rare moment in history. It was ten years ago. In your assessment, you know, now after a decade, is there any such kind of new discrepancy, or you know, is there any any you know possibility or, or danger, uh, you know, such kind of uh, um, you know out, outpacing? Or, or it will, will take place. You know, it, it, do, what, what do you see the the real, you know, danger uh, or or possibility of crisis uh, again? Do, do you foresee such kind of crisis in the near future? Uh, I think that uh, the crisis is is not about you know um, uh, a new uh, so-called Arab Spring, but I think the, the the crisis in in the in the future, and I think is it's, it's the current crisis. Is, I think is um, the loss of identity online. So mm -hmm. so when we are talking about young generation, for example, they don't have you know a proper compass because of the all of the things that are going on in the cyberspace and there is no guidance uh, from the government. Uh, I, I'm not speaking about Egypt, I'm speaking about the governments and, and, and all. If we are speaking about governments, there is no guidance for, for cyberspace. Even there is no, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, guides even in the schools how to, to deal with with cyberspace when it comes to uh, digital literacy, for example, you, you see that all those generations, young generations are digitally native, but from my perspective, they are, they are illiterate and digitally illiterate. They, they need to be, you know, they, have, they need to have literacy, how to use uh, digital 
components, how to be digitally literate. And this is, I think this is the, the most important thing that you new know, governments need to work on, how to make those young generations working in a proper compass and how also to uh, create guidance for using the proper use of the cyberspace. And this will also will protect us from things like fake news and all those things. But, uh, but this, is, this is not available, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for really, you know, your informative, uh, 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 you know, a comment.